Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, right, so after Jim's talk, you all know what social machines are, right? Yeah? You probably also got a feeling of the complexity of the area. Um, some people even say that social machines is almost as large as web science. Um, so, me giving you a tutorial, so telling you how to build a social machine or how to do research in this field is actually quite challenging. So, I'm going to try my best, but let me start by saying that we actually don't know what makes a social machine successful or not. So I can tell you some of the things that we have studied, we as a community have studied and know right now. I can try to give you some guidelines of things you should try or things that you should try to avoid. However, when you're going to be put in front of a big question Here's a social machine for the topic X. How do you build it? How do you build it from scratch? How do you make it more successful than it is? Just be prepared to try all sorts of things. Be prepared to fail often. Um, so if there is one thing that you take from this presentation is like is the general approach that you have to be ready to follow. You have to be ready to be flexible in your design. You have to have the tools, the machinery, to be able to observe everything that is going on in that system. You have to have the methods and the access to that community so that you can speak to them and listen to them. You, so you're gonna, it's going to be an evolving design. Yeah? Be prepared to fail, be prepared to listen. Be prepared to take small incremental steps to solve very specific problems that you will notice happening in that social machine, yeah? So that's all there is to it. And I'm going to give you um, some insight into some of these tools that you can apply. So we've heard already how important social machines are on the web and elsewhere. We've seen some fantastic examples already. So in this tutorial, I'm going to give you first my take on social machines, and then we're going to have an exercise where I would ask you to talk about social machines that you like, that you know of in groups, and about some of their characteristics. And then I'm sure that we are going to hear all sorts of views and angles, perhaps contradictory, ones on what social machines are and aren't. Um, then I'm going to, to, to teach you how to study crowdsourcing initiatives, crowdsourcing projects, which are arguably one type of social machines. I'm going to look at another class of social machines, which Jim already mentioned, um, which are citizen science projects or initiatives. This is something we've been doing a lot of research in Southampton. And I'm going to give you some examples from, very briefly, from our current research for you to get an understanding of what are the types of challenges that the, communi the research community is trying to answer at this point in time. Yeah? So those of you who are perhaps thinking about doing research in this area, to, to get a better understanding of the types of questions that we are trying to answer and the methods and the approaches that we're following. So we've seen this already, yeah? Um, this is the quote from Tim Berners-Lee's Weaving the Web, uh, which already in 1999 identified this combination of computational and human social processes as being an engine of creativity, of growth, of progress on the web 
and beyond. Well, when we now try to dig a bit deeper and characterize social machines, when we look at the successful exemplars, we are going to see a huge range of options. So we are going to see examples where people supply, curate, and analyze data. Oh, this is where that video was. Sorry. Yeah. Um, see, that was a video over there. Um, we had a bit of a dilemma uh, about opening the, the, the presentation file in the break. But in any case, so we see, we see examples like Duolingo. Yeah? For someone learning a language, Duolingo is a community where you go and do your lessons and, and, and improve your language skills. Yeah? From a social machine point of view, there is much more going on out there. Yeah? So the machine, the platform, has to give you feedback. So the machine has to know, whenever you make your exercises and your translations, whether you've done right or wrong, yeah? And they don't do that by putting someone in an office somewhere who knows French, and when you translate your exercises from English to French, that person is not sitting there 24-7 and saying yes or no. They are doing that by exploiting all the data that you create through your translations. In other cases, it is less perhaps about taking some data that is available and analyzing it. It is about creating content from scratch. So there is a whole class of social machines in which people come together without a well-defined purpose. They just go there to socialize. They just go there to share content that they have produced. And then other people can reuse that content, can comment it, can augment it. Yeah? So there is less of a sense of a purpose as in, let's classify a million galaxies. There is a much stronger social component, content production sharing scenario in which these social machines emerge. Twitter is another example as well. So there is no purpose of Twitter as such. It is not about winning elections. It is not about uh, starting a social revolution in a certain country. It is about sharing information. We see these platforms like Twitter, like YouTube, like Facebook, becoming themselves platforms for the, for the development of more purposive social machines. So you can use Twitter, for instance, to put together a group that then works together in a particular scenario, for example, disaster management. Yeah? In other cases, you can create content, a com you have a common goal of creating some sort of content from early on, and that's the example of Wikipedia. Yeah, Wikipedia has a purpose. It is about creating this general knowledge encyclopedia. Yeah, it wasn't that people created together. Yeah, it is a large enterprise. It is about creating content from scratch. And then in addition to that, obviously, you all know about the processes that are going on to revise, analyze that content. So two scenarios at least, one in which people and machines create new content, another one in which perhaps there is content already, there is data already that people want to look at and validate. Sometimes these projects involve volunteers. Wikipedia is an example. Yeah? So people do that because of a wide range of reasons we have only partially understood. Sometimes they do it for a specific reward. They want to do it because they want to win a competition. They want to do it because for some reason they feel good about themselves when they earn a million points and they're better than their neighbor. Yeah? So another dimension, at least, is the, purpose, is the question of why. 
Why would they do it? Other examples. People are elementary problem solvers. So it is, it is perhaps less about creating content, sharing it, augmenting it, analyzing it. It is about solving a particular challenge. You've heard about Netflix and the Netflix challenge, perhaps? So Netflix, at some point, wanted to improve their recommendation algorithm. So they launched this challenge with a high price. And then they've invited people, scientists in that case, from all over the world to solve that challenge. Jim also mentioned protein folding. This is a game, there are various games, but one of the most famous ones is called Fold It. So there is a general scientific problem that was set out by the team that designed that game. And then people all over the world joined and tried to solve that problem together. These problems can be very specific, like finding eight, was it eight, was it ten, a number of balloons, red balloons, all over the US within a very specific time frame. They can be very broad. On Quora, for instance, you can ask for solutions and advice on any type of problem as well. And the beauty of it all is that no matter how specific or how general your question is going to be, because we have the web, because we can reach out to millions and billions of people, we can expect, we can be confident that we are going to find answers, solutions to the problem we are defining. Why does it work? Because people care, because people want to share their views, because people want to compete, they want to, to become better at something. This is something that is um, an aspect that is often overlooked and we're going to talk about it in a little while. So many, many people assume that games work because people want to compete with each other. That's just part of the story. It turns out, in many cases, what's even a stronger driver to participate is that people want to improve, get better at what they're doing. So it's not so much about me getting more points than my colleague. It's about me seeing that I'm progressing, that I'm improving, that I'm solving the puzzles in a shorter period of time, that I'm getting feedback, and that I'm implementing that feedback and learn something. Yeah? In some cases, collaboration happens, or the problem solving happens in teams. And this can be because people enjoy working in teams, or it can be a necessity. So the Netflix challenge, for instance, was won by a team of teams who realized, so there are different scientific groups trying to solve this problem individually, they realized that they can succeed only if they combine their approaches. In other cases, collaboration happens because people like socializing. So solving a puzzle without talking to other people about it is perhaps less entertaining, less appealing, less motivating than doing it on your own. And in fact, one of the reasons why people say the, ES, the ESP game was so successful was not because people were getting more and more points and were improving or were overtaking some of the other players in the leaderboards. It was because of the mechanism that this game implemented. So if you remember, Jim told you a little bit about it. It's a two players game. You get a problem to solve, and you solve it only if you and the other player, who have no other means to talk to each other, give matching answers. So playing against or with someone else you have never met before, someone from another corner of the world, and then looking at the same thing and having exactly the same thought that you put into the same words was a very strong driver 
for um, for people to continue participating. They just they just thought this is this this is a this is great, this is funny, this is entertaining. So collaboration for various reasons. As a side note, in the ESP game, this collaboration mode just had some side effects as well. So the setting was you see an image and then you start writing words that describe that image. And you get points only if the answers match. Now can someone tell me what tends to happen when you, when you reward people to give matching tags that describe an image? More Sorry? More, well, it's not quite more general, but that's the right intuition, yeah? So if I look at this object, if I see a picture of this object, yeah? And you see a picture of this object, I could start talking, I could say green, I could say object, I could say blackboard, I could say all sorts of things and they would all be correct. But the probability for my answer to match yours <coughs> is if my answer is at somewhere in the middle from a generality point of view, so I can't give too exotic of an answer because it's very likely that this, the, my opponent, my co-player, is not going to come up with that particular answer. I can't be too generic either, yeah? So what happened is, and this is why Jim mentioned those taboo words, what happened was that very quickly they realized that this collaboration between players meant that they kept on giving you the same two or three labels, which were the most obvious ones. Now those answers, after being heard, being submitted thousands of times, were considered correct. And there are various ways how you could do that, yeah? But then it also meant that at some point, the game stopped producing useful answers. Yeah, so they had to introduce these taboo words as well, so that they make sure that whatever answers would come in after a while, they would still be useful. So that's just, that's just a side note for you to understand the complexities of collaboration. Yeah, so we said, what did we say? We said people sometimes create new content, sometimes they look at the existing data and analyze it, uh, they do it for various reasons and rewards. They do it in teams. Uh, they compete. Netflix challenge was a competition. The DARPA balloon challenge was a competition. Um, this, this thing on the right-hand side um, is a platform called Innocentive. Have you heard about it? No? So it is, it is what you call an open innovation platform that um, aims to solve big challenges. In this particular case, it was, it was set up in, uh, in the pharmaceuticals industry. So they had all sorts of research problems that could not be solved as quickly as they wanted by their R&D departments. So instead, what they did is they went and defined the problem put it on the platform and said, well, people all around the world, scientists or, or whomever, try to solve this for a given price. Yeah? So it is a competition, um, and, and, and people find this element of being better than someone else or being the best in the world quite compelling sometime, sometimes. Another example is something called Kaggle. You heard about it? Yeah? Uh, so that's very similar to incentive from a, from a competition point of view. Uh, it's more focused towards data challenges. Yeah. So sometimes, sometimes you, you do things on your own. Sometimes you um, build a group and work with other people. Uh, sometimes you, you just want to be the best in the world and win. The problem is, besides the fact that we don't know when these things work out and how they will play out, um, is that you really need to keep an eye 
on the quality of the answers of the data that is being produced. Because like any other social process at large scale on the web, it can have all sorts of unintended effects. Um, Wikipedia has the problem of vandalism. Yeah? Uh, so there are people who, for whatever reasons, go in and, and spam and try to destroy specific articles. Um, for other reasons, I think Jim also mentioned this example from Luis Van An with the captures, where there are groups of people somewhere in the world who would just who are willing to put in a huge amount of energy and resources to practically game the system, use it in a way that it wasn't it wasn't intended. Uh, sometimes this happens not out of some sort of evil reasons, but just because the people you're talking to are biased towards a certain point of view, or because you've asked the question in the wrong way, and then you wonder why 52% of your crowd is going to answer the question in a way that you actually didn't expect it, and you have to go through with it. So it is really important to understand and to have the means to observe how your social machine is developing and to decide when and how to act, interact with them, or counteract their activities. Um, was this question there? Yes. You were talking about gaming the system, right? Uh, so we had this uh, condition which happened in India. Mm -hmm. So it is, it is a huge problem. It, is, it becomes even greater of a challenge when decision makers act upon that information. Yeah? Um, what is the solution to that? Well, there are some partial solutions. But uh, for, from a point of view of someone building a social machine, the least you could do is to have a good idea before you start about what makes your social machine successful. What are the parameters that you can define for your own scenario um, that would allow you to achieve the purpose of the social machine, and to find ways to observe and to a certain extent measure those parameters and be able to act upon them. Uh, when it comes to Wikipedia, I mean, there are hundreds and hundreds of rules they're trying to um, achieve just that. So there's the governance model, there is the uh, neutrality policy of Wikipedia, which um, can to a certain extent be, be enforced. In general, the, the um, assumption is that because Wikipedia and every article is reviewed and edited by so many people, that a balance will eventually emerge. Now, we all know this is not true, uh, but let's say there are scenarios in which, in which this works better. So, for example, um, have you heard about Wikidata? Yeah? So Wikidata has this wonderful thing. We still have to see how it's going to play out. But Wikidata, one of their um, design principles was, well, because Wikipedia, unlike, unlike Wikipedia, which wants people to agree on a common point of view, and then if they don't, they just block the article and you can't edit it anymore. They say, well, we actually allow different points of view altogether. So if you want to say that 
Paris has 5.5 uh, million inhabitants, that's perfectly fine, and someone else come in, can come in and, and, and give a completely different statement. As long as you have a source backing that up, we're perfectly fine with it. We're not going to ask people to start fighting about what is the correct answer to that question. Just going to, for now, we're going to allow for different statements to exist in the same time. And then it is up to the people or the applications using that information to make up their mind. Now, this approach has other problems, like you can imagine. But the assumption is that it will at least reduce the number of edit words and it will encourage a plurality of views to coexist. Yeah. All right. So we're not much smarter than we were before. Yeah. What these slides told you is that there are so many classes of social machines. Yeah. You already have a little bit of a feeling about the dimensions that I'm thinking about to classify them to map this landscape. So I talked a little bit about working in groups ver versus working on your own versus competing with others. I talked about rewards and volunteering. I talked about what people do, sharing content, socializing versus creating, working towards a common, a common goal. Um, but I haven't quite solved the problem, not at all. Yeah. So when the big question comes in, what makes a social machine successful? How to build a social machine that will thrive? We just don't know. Um, and it's going to take you and the generations after you probably to, to completely map this landscape. We do know a few things though. Yeah? So when we look at the exemplars of social machines that we would consider successful. They tend to have some things in common. Yeah? One of the things that is definitely there that characterizes all successful social machines and compa compared to similar approaches which have perhaps failed is the fact that they can reach their goal effectively. One of the aspects is obviously the scale. So they can attract lots of people somehow. Yeah? And this means they can mobilize resources and ideas very timely. Just I mean in scenarios like like disaster sorry, like disaster management, this is quite critical. Yeah, so they solve their goals in due time because of the amount of contributions they get. Amount of contributions means lots of people, can mean lots of ideas of which you can pick the best ones. Um, it can also mean access to large amounts of data. Yeah, so you you achieve a lot in a matter of days or weeks. Yeah. This is, for disaster management, this is very important, but it also, in general, it is important to see that there is progress. There's nothing worse to going to a social network and see, well, the last post has been two weeks ago. Yeah, you already start thinking whether that social machine is alive or not. Yeah? So, so the ability to, to keep going, to generate that participation, to make sure that there is enough contributions and things going on within that social machine is important as well. And scale, so having a broad bra a base of people participating, is, is one way to do that. Jim already mentioned the question of trust. So it is important that when someone goes to Wikipedia that perhaps they don't trust everything that's written in an article, 
But they do assume that because of the way it is generated, because of the number of people using it, that that information is valuable. And one of the reasons why this works is not just because the information is up to date and very broad in terms of topics, which is achieved by making sure that contributions happen in an efficient and effective way, but also because the process, the editing process in itself is perceived as being fair. Everyone can contribute, putting aside all those rules that you have to, to be familiar with in the meantime. But one of the, one of the principles that make social machines thrive is that everyone can contribute. There are not many barriers to engagement. In fact, some of them even reward top contributors. So the more you actually invest in that system, the greater your value is in that community. So you start taking on new roles or being rewarded for what you're doing. Number seven is something that's been mentioned in the previous talk as well. So no matter whether you pay people to do things through points, through money, whether you assume they will work voluntarily, when you build a, a, a social machine, you have to ask yourself the question, why would people contribute in the first place? Well, actually, you have to ask yourself the question, how do I get the people to even see this new system that I'm building? But let's just assume they do. Why in the world would they do it? And you can achieve a lot with rewards. But many voices would say that's not entirely sustainable. If the points that you give someone in a game don't actually mean much for that player, being their self-esteem or the fact that their ego that is boosted and the fact that they uh, win against their, their office neighbor, if those points don't mean anything for that person, you will not be able to keep people engaged. They will reach their one million point target, which they define for a certain reason, and then they'll stop. Because there is a mismatch between the incentive that you have built in and the reasons why people engage with your system. And that's one of the reasons why something like Duolingo works so well. Because people go there with their purpose, with the purpose to learn a language, whereas the designer, their aim is, besides allowing people to learn language in a community, to improve machine translation. Yeah? So the data the community generates is used in an ethical, an effective way to train algorithms. The more people engage with the system, the more data they generate, the more accurate that data is. So the designer has an incentive as well to improve the system a lot, to define new challenges, to add new badges, to add new features to the system. Yeah? Whereas I want to improve my French, so I will keep going to the system. Yeah? Yes. Uh, yes, that's true. Um, so, did everyone understand what, what the comment was about? So, um, two things. Public good, or common good, is a powerful motivator. People like contributing to something that um, would serve everyone. They like it in theory, or they like it more than when whatever they're doing is used for the benefit of a group of people. OK, 
Can someone tell me what happens if uh, uh, when you have a, when you're in a public good scenario like that? So when you say, oh, let's just build something for the greatness of humanity. Let's all come together and join our forces and build this wonderful thing that everyone can use. Sorry? I didn't get that. Yes, could you elaborate? So one of the things, thank you, one of the things that happens is called free riding, yeah? So some people will do the work, everyone will contribute. Now this happens all the time, it's just a matter of balance, yeah? Um, another thing is just that there are so many good causes in the world. And while in theory we sympathize with people who are perhaps struggling in life or perhaps would need our help, there are all these other things that capture our, our attention. And we still decide to play Angry Birds or whatever people are playing this, this, uh, these days for hundreds and thousands of hours. While we know people have all sorts of problems elsewhere and we could actually help them. <coughs> yeah? All right. Uh, so we talked about the left-hand side. We talked about aligned incentives. So what I was trying to say about in the Duolingo example is that when you could reward participation, but if you're incentives, if your rewards are not going to be aligned, if what, you, what you're asking people to do is not aligned with what they value, what they want to do anyway, this is not going to work in the long run. We don't know, one second, we don't know how to do this right, but we at least have the duty to ask ourselves this question before we even start. So when you set up your own system and you want people to label your images, ask yourself, why would people do it? And ask yourself not just, why would people do it for 10 minutes when they first see the thing? Ask yourself about why would they come back? Why would they do it when they could cure cancer uh, and look at pictures of cats? and go do their groceries, yeah? And when you manage to answer that question, it can be a really, really powerful thing. Like Duolingo demonstrates, yeah? Yes, there was a question at the back. Yes, okay, yeah, very well. So, uh, several points there. There's a lot of literature in economics about this. So, first of all, there is sometimes a gap between the theoretical benefit that I have from this general, broad public good I'm generating and my immediate benefit. Yeah, so the effects that this thing this open source software has on my life. Yeah? So when this gap is not when this gap is too big, people will will, will stop contributing. Yeah? Um, also there is a question of how do you explain the benefits for people to understand them and in a way that is close to, to, to their life as well. In terms of technology, again, we don't know much. What we do know from HCI, from uh, online community design, um, is that we need to have user-friendly tools for people to use. So whatever system you're going to put in front of your 
community, of your contributors, it has to be easy to use. It can't have obvious bugs. Now, one mistake that people make when they start working on social machines is they think, if I polish the system long enough, it's going to be fine. It's not going to be fine. It turns out that something that is useful and usable and looks polished and neat, the only thing it does, it just makes sure that people don't go away after 10 seconds. Yeah? It doesn't at all solve the question of why would they do it in the first place. So you have to have, which means it doesn't, it doesn't make your life as social machines researcher easier. Because we tend, at least in computer science, we tend to build some prototypes that look more or less polished. The interfaces are still rather patchy, yeah? So building a social machine, a, a new social machine, when you're a researcher, is very, very difficult because you have to get the system at a level that is the same as, say, a, game, a professional game designer. The good news is there's lots of technologies that you can use already out of the box. The other good news is you actually don't need to do that much. There are lots of social machines examples that work really, really well with very simple functionalities, SMS-based. Yeah? If people want to contribute to it if the incentives are aligned. So think about human-computer interactions. Think about the interfaces. Think about how easy or difficult or ambiguous <laughs> you make it for people to contribute. So if someone, very simple example, if I go to a social machine platform and I want to contribute and I log in and you don't tell me immediately what I can do for you, if you ask me to register, and if you ask me to fill in all these details, and if you, if you don't allow anonymous contributions, you're going to lose lots of people. Yeah? You want to give people the, the opportunity to contribute immediately. After that, you can say, all right, so don't you want to register? Because then you have access to these pictures of cats, which you really wanted to see. Yeah. Don't ask them to register first. Tell them immediately what they need to do. Here's the picture of cats that I want you to annotate. And if you do, then we manage to label our first batch of cat pictures, which means this and this and this, yeah? So tell them what to do, and tell them that if they do just a little bit, something really great will happen. These three things already achieve a lot. Most people don't do them. Yeah? So HCI. Cross-platform support. Well, it turns out that social machines don't emerge in isolation. So I already gave you this example with Twitter as a social ma machine, where people post, share information, retweet, whatever. And then these vertical social machines that use Twitter as a platform like the Arab Revolution, yeah? Um, other effects, you have, for instance, links between different social networks. You should be able to, in order to attract contributors, in order to be able to use and reuse their contributions in a wide variety of contexts, it is really important that you don't lock in community and the outcomes that they generate in one particular platform. And finally, and this is perhaps our bias in the type of works we are doing, openness. Openness in everything. So we've talked about public good. We talked about working for something that many people could use and benefit from. We talked about um, avoiding platform lock-in, so open data. We also talk, what I haven't talked about is perhaps reusing some of the data people create in one social machine or another in the most effective way. So what we see at the moment, and I hope things will improve, is 
a whole range of citizen science projects, a whole range of games for the purpose, uh, paid microtask crowdsourcing, um, all sorts of projects and activities in which human contributors are asked for help. Now, the data they are producing is not used or reused as widely as it could be. Every game with a purpose is going to ask you to label images over and over again. Yeah? That's not only a waste of human skills, it is also very bad for science. Because many of these activities, their aim is not to keep us in the loop all the time as humans to create training data sets or to improve what the algorithms are doing. Uh, their aim is to make sure that even if we are asked to label 100 images, that eventually this would lead to a better balance between what algorithms can do and what we could do. Remember Tim Berners-Lee's definition um, or quote about people doing the creative work, being supported by, uh, by, by machines in what they're doing. Yeah? So this is one of the areas which, at least in my opinion, uh, requires a lot of attention. Having the ability to make the most out of the outcomes that are produced for public good purposes by crowds. Yeah? All right. Um, all this research, at least in Southampton, is done as part of a uh, big grant which is called Socium, the theory and practice of social machines. So um, it is a collaboration between the University of Edinburgh, the University of Oxford and, and Southampton. It's been running for three and a half years I think now. So we're looking at questions like what is a social machine, what can, how can we characterize it, how do we know if a social machine is successful or not? What do we look at in order to know? Uh, we're also looking at particular types, classes of social machines, from uh, online communities to social networks to citizen science to crowdsourcing projects in human computation. And I'm going to talk about this a little bit more after, after lunch. Um, I'd encourage you to, to have a look at the website of the project where all our publications are. Um, we're on Twitter as well, and we're, we have various workshops uh, where you could perhaps submit a paper if you're interested in the topic to, uh, to get in touch with the, with the community. All right. So I talked about social machines. Now we're getting to the first exercise, yeah? So what I would want you to do is to build groups, three people, say, um, and for the next 15 minutes, I want you to think and discuss exemplars of social machines that you're familiar with. I want you to think about whether they are successful and what makes them successful. And then if we have time, I also want you to think whether whatever platform you think of is a social machine or could it be characterized as one of these other things. Maybe it is an example of collective intelligence. Maybe it exhibits wisdom of the crowd properties. Maybe it is just plain crowdsourcing. Yeah? Um, and then, after these 15 minutes, um, I'm going to ask each group to tell us what they've done. And then you're going to see the mess we're into. Yeah? So. <laughs> because I am in this mess as well. So I am part of this. I am just looking for new ideas and insights into. So I, look. They're, they're filming me. There's absolutely no problem. Yeah? So what I'm trying to tell you is I gave you some pointers. 
But the problem is not solved. You need an incentive? <laughs> All right, you don't have to do it. You don't have to do it. I mean, you could just look at your colleagues, how they engage with the topic, and you could just answer your emails. There's no problem whatsoever. Um, if you registering for this event is not an incentive enough to make the most out of this, is you not trusting me that this actually has a purpose is not enough. Then. Not, not a problem at all. Okay, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> all right, so we do. One here, one here. You guys perhaps come together somehow. Yeah? Um, and uh, of course, you're, you're welcome to join the exercise if it's not too much to ask. <laughs> yeah? So maybe two here. You don't want to work with them? Oh my God, why, why did I do this? <laughs> no, if we join together, yeah. we might have too many common ideas. Uh huh. Okay. Well, so why don't you do, why don't you guys do it like this, yeah? And then because because these two guys don't want to work together because they're too similar. So how about you two work with him and you two with him? Yeah. Yeah. Is that all right? Come on. So we've seen just before lunch that. <coughs> Social machines could be pretty much anything. It can be our email system. We've heard um, online banking mentioned. We've heard app stores being mentioned. We had Wikipedia. Uh, so perhaps thinking about them in these terms is not the most useful thing to do when you actually have to go and build one. So we're going to try and look at social machines from a particular angle. And this angle is crowdsourcing. Could someone try to explain what they think is the difference between Crowdsourcing and social machines. Wow. So this is crowdsourcing. In short, it's about solving problems via what they call an open call. Yeah? So could someone try to explain what the difference would be between a crowdsourcing system and a social machine system? Yes. Who's contributing? Yes, yeah. Another person will take definition. Yeah. Okay. Do we agree with this? So it is. Yeah. So 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 what this suggests, and I think I think it's true, is that social machines are a broader class of system. So in in social machines, in Wikipedia, it is the community that has an influence on the rules of the game, as opposed to in crowdsourcing where the roles are very much defined. So you have someone which is called, let's call him a requester. So it's someone who has a problem. And for some reason, they cannot solve that problem in a conventional way. What does conventional mean? Conventional means they cannot hire professionals to solve the problem. They cannot use their own employees in an organization to solve the problem. Why? Because it would be perhaps too expensive or because, because they just don't have those resources flexibly available at any point in time to solve that problem. Yeah? So instead what they do is they go and have this open call. So they reach out to a wider range of people. Why do they, what do they hope to achieve with that? Well, they have, first of all, they try to um, deal with the constraints they have internally, so expand on the 
potential amount of contributions they get. They're, it's perhaps cheaper as well, especially if you engage people to contribute voluntarily. Um, they reach out to a much broader base of ideas as well, so perhaps the results are, are better. Yeah? So this is what we mean by an open call. Yeah? So there are overlaps between crowdsourcing and social machines. When you look at a crowdsourcing project, you will still find elements of algorithmic computation, and you will find then social components where people or groups of people contribute as well. So there are similarities as well, but you will have this separation of concerns where there's someone defining the goal, this is what I want you to do, and then the crowd contributing. Yeah? However, even if we narrow down the scope like we did, there are still quite a few options to choose. So if now you're in a situation in which instead of saying, I'm going to build a social machine for problem X, you're going to say, I'm going to launch an open call, you still have to make a few decisions. First of all, there are different forms of crowdsourcing as well, and some apply better or worse to your type of problem. Have you heard about micro-tasks? Yeah? Yeah? Mechanical Turk? Yeah? Um, so Mechanical Turk is a platform for executing paid micro-tasks. Microtasks means that the problem that I want to solve, no matter how big it is, can be divided into smaller pieces, micro pieces, that someone can solve independently of the rest of the group. So you execute a large number of these small tasks in parallel. Why would you want to do this? Why would you want to split the work and give it out to a large number of people? Sorry? So you increase the speed. Yeah? What, what is the disadvantage? Why doesn't everyone do micro tasks? Yeah? Yeah, so not everything can be broken down into smaller pieces. Division of labor, is this pro or against? Against, okay, can you elaborate? Yes, so I think this is a concern that affects any sort of crowdsourcing, yeah? not just micro tasks. But, so one important thing is that you, in some cases you have so many dependencies between the micro tasks that, you, that it requires lots of coordination. Yes? Yeah? Yeah? Mm -hmm. Okay, could, could, could you explain what you mean by the wisdom of the crowd and give me an example? Okay, so you want an annotated date set, all right? Uh huh, okay. So why can't you use Mechanical Turk for that? Uh huh. All right. So, um, comment on that. So, our friend here, he wants to annotate a data set. Has data, wants to do annotations. His concern is maybe I could break down the task into smaller pieces, so each person annotates a little part, but they will not take it seriously. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. right, yeah. So you could, for instance, one second, you could, for instance, say, you said, yes, people might not agree. And yes, there are situations in which this is a challenge. So the typical way to deal with it is to ask lots of people and look, you know, what the majority says, what would be, and that's an, an implicit form of agreement. Yes, there was a comment there. Or maybe you do pay them, but you don't take the data into account. Yeah? Does this, does this make sense to you? Yeah? Uh, so there are, a few, there are a few things that were mentioned. There was a question of, can we break down the task into smaller pieces? And we can in some cases, and we can't in others. Yeah? Uh, let me just give you an example. Let's take the task. I want to, I have a 20 pages document, and I want to translate it from English into French. Let's microtask this one, yeah? Translating and putting one person on 20 pages is going to take two weeks. I can't wait. I want to have it in one hour. How would we microtask it? <laughs> Sorry, si speak up. Uh huh. Okay. So opinion number one says, if someone translates one sentence, uh, the second person would need to see what the first person translated, so that they can use the same words in the same way. There has to be coordination. I think you can give it at least five people to do this combination of everything. Someone who is going to come back, and the rest fifteen people could be translating the whole thing. Mm hmm. Yes. Yes. Okay, all right. Because you would need all five people to, to work on it collaboratively. Okay, yes? You know, some kind of uh, groups of people do either one sentence or one paragraph. Two, not one, two sentences or two paragraphs, then simply combine them. So I have ten people do each sentence and then just take one together. All right, so, so we're getting into the right direction, yeah? So far, no one has told me, how about we just split the document into ten pages each? Because it's going to get easy. You're still going to have coordination, but it's going to be between two people. And you've, perhaps it's easier to find someone to translate you 10 pages than 20. And that's, that's, that's something important, yeah? So microtasks does not necessarily mean you do it at sentence level, yeah? So when you break down the task, the unit of work is very important. It has to be small enough for people to have lots of people working in parallel, it has to be big enough to give some context. Because otherwise, you just do it at word level. And imagine the mess you would create then, yeah? So the first question is, how big should the chunks be? And there are advantages. In the, you could do it at the page level, and then you have 20 tasks. You could do it at the paragraph level, sentence level, yeah? Then, as you said, you need to have some coordination afterwards. So we're going to, uh, this is what you call a complex workflow. So the way, the way we know it works on Mechanical Turk is as follows. They go and they split it in paragraphs. In paragraphs. They source it out. They give it to more than one person. So each paragraph is translated from, by more than one person. Then they do a second round of tasks in which they show people they ask people to vote which of these three translations of this paragraph is, is better. Yeah? Then they take everything, because also something that we haven't mentioned is there may, there's more than one way to translate from one language to another. Yeah? So then you have the second, the second type of task is just asking, given these three translations, which one would you prefer? You ask people, uh, you get the votes. Then you have your best translations. And then in the third round, you actually go and do what you, what you guys said. So you have actually people who go and make sure everything's consistent. Yeah? And then you can go on forever. You could go and have different versions for those as well and have people vote for those as well. Point is, it works. It's just it's not as straightforward as 
as, as, as one might think. Okay, let me just move on. So, not everything can be done effectively in, as a microtask. And you see already we're talking about five, four, uh, four to five types of microtasks for just one particular problem. Yeah? There are things, however, that require a certain type of expertise, which you cannot just put on mechanical Turk and expect people to to know about them, because they just require too much context. Mm -hmm. Innocentives, the types of scientific challenges on innocentives or on, on uh, Kaggle, you will not put them on Mechanical Turk. So everything that you cannot really describe in a step-by-step -step fashion cannot be microtasks like that, yeah? So in those cases, you have other forms of, of, of crowdsourcing, like challenges, for instance, yeah? where you give the whole problem as such, you tell people what you want to achieve so that they can compare themselves with the baseline and know if they're likely to win or meet the target or not. Yeah? Uh, in other cases, you could actually think about breaking down the work into smaller pieces. So, back to my question, are social machines just crowdsourcing? Can you give me an example of one social machine that is not crowdsourcing? I think, it, I mean, I would disagree. I would say this is a social machine. Because you have, you, the program manager with the viewers together, they have all sorts of signals and votes and reviews, and they decide upon how the program is going to be adjusted. Yeah, so I think it is very, I think I would say it's an example of both. Actually, if you, if you have one of those programs where, where people vote, you do take it into account, right? Otherwise, you, you don't do it. All right. Yeah, okay. So that's, um, that's one example. Another example is, well, let's just ask, let's just ask this other side of the room. Yes, please. Facebook. Facebook. It's certainly a social machine. It has loads of people interacting and doing various things. Yeah. But it's various things. There's no one goal that the crowd achieves. Exactly. Yeah? So, in all these areas in which you have some sort of sharing, socializing, networking, there is not one entity saying, this is the goal, and everyone's going in the same direction to achieve that goal. Yeah? So, that would be, I would say, one of the, one of the differences. Uh, some other differences, so one of the big things in social machines, like the name says, is this aspect of sociality. So you give people the ability to talk to each other, to exchange ideas, to talk about the rules of the game, change the rules of the game as well. Research shows that Having this sort of social interaction means in classical crowdsourcing projects, for instance, as extension to Mechanical Turk, helps. Yeah? And there are other platforms besides Mechanical Turk and Crowdflower where this is actually very, very useful. For instance, in citizen science, it has been shown that Mo some of the most interesting things that happen when the, within the projects, ex including the example that Jim had this morning, were only made possible not because they actually have 50,000 people annotating a million galaxies in a week, not because of the amounts of data gen they generated, but because of the fact that people were, had a means to go and talk to each other and these discussion forums, and, and then they defined their own tasks, and they went and looked at images on, completely on their own. 
yeah? Um, and did so much more than generating data that professional scientists, so to speak, can use in their algorithms, yeah? There is lots of research in crowdsourcing as well that has shown how you could use social channels to improve the performance of the contributors, but also their engagement. So the fact that they can talk and express their opinions and exchange experiences with other members of the crowd has a positive impact on, on engagement. Another criticism or another difference between crowdsourcing and social machines, you hear often, well, social machines are about people doing the creative things and machines doing the boring stuff. Whereas in crowdsourcing, in many cases, you have very routine tasks that use our cognitive skills or visual skills uh, for tasks that computers perhaps will be able to master in five years, just not now and not in a short period of time. So crowdsourcing has been criticized for the fact that they waste all this creative potential of humans for just things that in the end an algorithm would be able to do in six months if you invest the time to train it properly. Yeah? Yes, I think this is a valid criticism. It applies, however, more to microtasks than to everything else. So Kaggle is not a waste of human creativity, for instance. Yeah? So we have, to be, we, have to be, uh, we have to distinguish between different types of, uh, of, of crowdsourcing as well. And then there is, related to that, the big question of ethics. How much are we paying people? Do we tell people how we're going to use all this data they are generating? The ESP game was sold to Google. All the data that was generated to improve image retrieval, to label images, just went and, well, arguably it improved Google search, but in the same time it improved the way they can link ads to search results and so on and so forth, yeah? Then there is, the, of course, the question of payment when you start paying people. The average wage of someone spending their time on Mechanical Turk or Crowdflower or any of these platforms is definitely lower than what you would get in a regular job. Yes? Yes. So there, this is an ongoing debate, and there are various answers on how to solve, how to solve this problem. So some people say, well, think about all the flexibility you have. Yeah, you can start working whenever you want. You can stop working whenever you want. No one asks you to be there from nine to five. And in fact, if they do they increase the prices greatly. Yeah, so there is this whole area of near real-time crowdsourcing. When you want the result to, to be there, when you want the answers to be there within seconds, you have to pay the crowd much more. Yeah, so prices go up if you want more guarantees. Then on the other hand, the average price per task has increased a lot. I mean, it started from being one cent seven years ago, now it's more between five cents and, uh, and, and, and ten, yeah? That's not a lot. It's still much lower than what you would pay experts in some countries, but nevertheless, the crowd workforce, so to speak, start organizing themselves as well. So there are discussion forums on the web where um, the crowd talks about different requesters and how fair they are, and how well they pay, and how much feedback they give. And the request is the request to you go and make sure you're not blacklisted, because no one will actually, there is so much work out there on Mechanical Turk, that if you're blacklisted as a requester, then people will not take on the tasks anymore, yeah? So the laws are changing as well in different countries. Um, so 
that, for instance, is one of those areas, if you're still looking for something challenging to think about, this could be quite, uh, quite interesting from a web science point of view. As well as everything else here. So, if we think that designing a social machine is complex, it doesn't get much easier if you just restrict the class of systems you're looking at to crowdsourcing. You still have to think about what I, are you asking the people to do. You have to think about workflows. We talked about machine translation and the various ways in which you can actually break this down. You have to think about your wording. How do you ask the question? How do you phrase it? How do you show it? So the interfaces. You have to think about what do you do with the data? So we've heard earlier in the discussion that, well, you could look at the performance of the worker somehow, and then you could reject some of the work, and you, could, you have to be able to decide that without doing the work yourself. Yeah? So if I want to improve the Netflix recommendation algorithm, I have to be very careful about what exact, how do I, how do I measure these improvements? Because I want to be able to select the winner very easily. If I have micro tasks, I don't want to, first of all, I don't have a gold standard for the entire problem space, otherwise I wouldn't crowdsource it, yeah? So I have to think, I have to think about the best ways to identify good, correct answers. And one way would be to recognize good contributors. Other would be to find all sorts of other consistency checking ways among the answers, majority voting, and so on and so forth, yeah? Task assignment. How do I, if I have a set of problems and a set of people, how do I match in the best possible way? Then how do I train the crowd so that they become better on themselves? What, what rewards do I give? Um, what kind of forms of group work and the like will I, uh, will I allow? I mentioned real-time delivery. Say, what if I need the answer within an hour? Um, so these are all types of things. First of all, you can do a PhD in these areas, but you have to think about them when you start crowdsourcing. And this is not the lunch break. This was supposed to be the lunch break before they took away half an hour from me. So now we're back from lunch for good. So we're thinking about social machines as crowdsourcing. And now I'm going to tell you how I look at the problem. Yeah? When someone tells me, how I want to do this, let's crowdsource it. How do I think about it? And there are four categories that I like to think about. And some will be more obvious than others. The what, the who, the how, and the why. And that's not from me, that's from people who are mu much smarter than me. In particular, have you heard about the collective intelligence genome? It's worth looking at, yeah? That's work from MIT. They have looked at the question of when is a group more intelligent than the sum, uh, than the individuals taken together. So they looked at group properties, as in number of people, gender, backgrounds, all sorts of things, yeah? They've tried to characterize smart groups, yeah? And the way they characterize it, the way they built this genome is along similar categories, yeah? So the what, the who, the how, and the why. The what is, what am I trying to achieve? The who is the actual crowd. And I know the definition says open call, but it's never actually op that open. There are biases. Think about, so you want to crowdsource, what are you going to do? You're going to go to a social media platform, right? Well, you're going to reach out to a particular number of people. Yeah? You send it to a mailing list, put it to a website. So there will be, you have to think, about the people who are likely to even consider participating, yeah? 
uh, and what kind of what kind of background they have, what kind of motivations they have, and so on. Then there is the how, which is exactly what I was telling you earlier. How are you going to break the, ta the problem into tasks? How are you going to ask the question? How does the workflow look like? What do you do with the data? Uh, the actual process. And then finally, why would anyone care? Why would they actually do it? for the rewards that you are offering, if any, yeah? So let's look at Zooniverse. Zooniverse is a collection of citizen science projects. There, is, there are no rewards as such. So work on contributions to Zooniverse are for free. Most Zooniverse projects don't gamify the tasks, yeah? There are no badges. There's absolutely no way for you to brag about what you're doing. Um, so what is outsourced in this case? Depending on the projects, there are 30 or so citizen science projects. Um, all of them are very much in this human computation space. So there is some sort of technical task. You have to recognize some sort of object in an image. You have to listen to an audio file. And every time you hear a scream, you have to click a button. Uh, you're watching a video with a worm that is doing something. And every time the worm turns left, you click. Um, and this is useful data, no matter what you think. Yeah. Um, so the point is, just like in many other examples, of microtask crowdsourcing, these are things that do not require a particular training. It's enough if you look at the video and see what is going on and you know how to click, then you're pretty much going to be on top of your game. Yeah? And this is the general case in crowdsourcing, in particular when it comes to microtasks. You want to be able to reach out to lots of people. This means also that the task cannot require too much context. So if they have to read one page to understand what is going on, they're not going to do it. Um, it turns out, even if you want to train them, you don't train them at the beginning. You train them actually much later on. And because only those people who really engage with the task will be the ones who will find some sort of um, pleasure or some sort of benefit in improving their own performance. You don't do it at the beginning. If you go to the, if you do a crowdsourcing exercise and you put, you ask people to register and then you say, watch this tutorial first to learn how to click around the interface. No. You have to let people go and start trying things on their own. And maybe that data is not going to be very good, but you have a much greater chance for them to to keep coming back, to continue to engage, then if you just tell them, OK, I assume from the very beginning you're not going to be able to solve the task on your own. I'm going to give you a two-minute tutorial. Yeah. So what is outsource? Who is the crowd? The crowd is really anyone who has the time and the interest to do it. The tasks are executed in parallel. So you have a million images with galaxies. And you just label them one image at a time. You have each image or each item handled by more than one person so that you can have a redundancy built into the system and are able to, un to understand which answer is, the, is, is likely to be correct. Um, and then you have different ways to consolidate the data that the crowds provide into something that you're confident is more or less accurate, but more about it later. Why do people contribute? So the general, the general insight for the time being is that um, people are just looking for something to do, to pass time. And they feel good about it. They feel better about themselves that while they are effectively not doing much, they are contributing to something bigger. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the fact that the fact, on the other hand, however, the fact you cannot put this scientific, uh, this scientific context too 
you can't make it too prominent because then people will start feeling, can someone tell me what will happen? So if you say now, come on, contribute to science, here's the images of the galaxies that will happen. It's too technical, it feels too much like work, yeah? It is, people don't feel confident. Yeah, so someone who's a school teacher in chemistry might think, oh, who are these people from the University of Oxford doing experiments? I mean, probably I'm not good enough. Probably I'm giving wrong answers. Yeah? Yeah, so, so and finally, uh, they fear, in some cases, that if they give the wrong answer, it will actually have an impact. There were, there were projects on Zooniverse that were, didn't work so well, so they were about, uh, pathology images that are used in cancer research. Very low engagement. People were really scared that they're, well, first of all, it was a comp complex task perhaps, but the actual reason was that people were thinking that this, these, their answers are going to be used on live patients. Yeah? Um, so, yes, contrib interest in science, but don't make that too much of a thing. Yeah? All right, so what, who, how, and why. Now we're moving to exercise number two. Yes. Yeah. In that case, I mean, wouldn't you like to sort of get away uh, from saying the uh, real fact, which is actually the truth? I mean, it could be, it could be wrong. I mean, you, you, you actually ask the crowd to tell you to do something, okay, but you're not telling them what exactly. I know you can, you can, but it's, it's a matter of if you put it on the front page, and if you tell, keep on telling them, oh, well, we're using this data now for this particular reason, or whether you let them actually do things and have fun with it, and if they want to know what, is, what happens with their data, they can always, it's always there, yeah? It's just a matter of making them feel that they're working, <laughs> or actually just letting them use the system the way they want, yeah? And if they don't want to ask any questions, you don't have to. Yeah? All right, the second exercise is called design your own. So I'm going to give you, the, the, the problem is a bit technical, sorry for that. Um, but, so this is an experiment we have carried out two years ago. And the problem is as follows. You know how important it is to share the data that you have created or used in your research with other people, yeah? Or when you read the paper, it's also good to know what data sets do they use when they run the experiments. Because if you want to reproduce the experiments, rerun the experiments, you, you would actually want to have access to the primary data or to know which data sets they use. So this is the link between a publication and the data they're using is important for all sorts of reasons, yeah? Unfortunately, these links are not present most of the time. So the aim of the exercise was, given a collection of papers and a collection of data sets, tell us which data sets are used in each paper. Or to simplify it, we just took one data set, the well-known DBpedia, yeah? So we wanted to be able to say which publications use DBpedia. Yeah, so we have DBpedia, we have publications. The task is create the links. Yeah? Um, so just as, a, just as a, a side note, so you go and look at Google Scholar, for instance, you type in DBpedia, I mean, this 9,650 figure is already very old, but just to get an idea about the scale of the exercise, imagine there are probably 10,000, 15,000 papers that we're talking about, so it's not something that you in your research are going to do. You're going to sit down and start looking through all the papers. You want to be able to source this out, yeah? All right, so I want you to form groups again. I want you to think about how would you crowdsource this, yeah? Think about the what, the what, the, what, the who, the how, and the why, yeah? Also think about 
How are you going to make sure that whatever links people will create, they are going to be correct? And, and remember, just because we're using human intelligence and social intelligence, it doesn't mean that we forget all the good things that computers can do as well. So you don't have to use just manual power for this. You can just very well say that this is, this is how much I can actually achieve with a computer program, and this is the bit where you can't move forward unless you have some manual input. So, 15 minutes. Yeah? Starting now. You can use the previous groups or something else. Ich glaube, ich habe ja nur ein Drittel meines Slides benutzt. Und das wird auch so bleiben. Ja, es passt schon. Ich habe das Tutorial in der Form noch nicht gemacht. Von daher, man weiß ja nie, wie es geht. Wie es läuft. Es ging mir am Donnerstag auch so, dass ich dann irgendwas zusammen gesucht hatte auf dem Weg nach Hannover und wieder zurück. Mhm, mhm, mhm. Ich habe auch keine Vorstellung. Mhm. Ach Gott sei Dank. Hat so einen Doktorand, der nicht so gut war. Und ich dachte schon, den muss ich feuern. Und jetzt hat er selber verstanden und aufgehört. Oh. Ja, super. Wenn Dinge mal so sich von alleine lösen. Aha. Wir wollten auch mal über diese Co-Creation-Geschichte noch mal reden. Ja. Genau, ja. Über Big Data Policy oder über Co-Creation? Weiß ich gar nicht mehr. Hm. Das ist gemein, da gibt es einen Call, der geht um diese Diskriminierungsgeschichte. Ah, ja, 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 ja. Ja, es kann ja beides sein, wirklich. Ja. Ich muss jetzt mal kurz schauen, wie schlimm es eigentlich ist. Wie viele Slides ich noch habe. Aber ich glaube schon, es gibt noch einen Haufen. Oh mein Gott. Hm. Ja, ich glaube, ich werde die Slides über Current Research komplett weglassen. Ja. Gott, was habe ich mir gedacht? Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. Sure, yeah, one second, one second, sure. I'm coming. Yes. You are, all right. Yes, hi. So is it is it the same, yeah? Yes, yes, yes. It's all data sets that are published within a paper automatically published through Wikipedia. Is that no. the assumption you're going no. through? No. Okay, so now we're trying to figure out how it can be published through Wikipedia? No. It's the question is, 
um, whether the paper, the research that the paper talks about, uses Dbpedia. Yes. Yeah. 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 Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. But I want to know that. You want to know which yes. paper? Yes. Yes. No. 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 I don't want to know. I want to know from all papers. If I to give you a paper, does it uses DBPD or not? Um, How? You well, you you read the paper. Can I ask? Meaning using Wikipedia is means they use link. Can show you what paper that uses. I haven't said anything about that. I haven't said anything about that. Yes. So the problem is that those papers were linked to Wikipedia and the problem solved is to find out if it uses Wikipedia. So for instance, for instance, I, I'm giving you already part of the solution. So Wikipedia has like millions of versions as well. Yeah. So when I go in and I want to build a new tool for say information extraction, yeah. Um, I want to test it against other tools as well. So I want to know exactly which ones have been tested on which, where are the papers that, of other tools that have used the same data so that I can compare them properly. Yeah? For instance, I can give you this example. Which yes. Is one paper that I have yeah. Read yeah, the problem, is, the problem is you don't want to look. So when you, when you do Google Scholar and you're going to get 10,000 papers, you don't want to look at them yourself, do you? No. no, you actually no, want to identify which of the papers uses DVP as yeah. a research. Yes, 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 you do. And you don't want to do it yourself by reading the papers. So yeah? you want to do crowdsourcing for that? Yes. So you want to pay people to read the papers for you? Uh, that's one option. Yeah. 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 That's what we're discussing right now. Yeah. 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 You might not have to pay them. So, one, my guess is that I say that yeah, but you still have to find out which one cited. If it's only the citation. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's, it's Even it's the citation is tricky to, to, to get automatically. No, no, if it's only the All right. citation, that, that, that doesn't take you. Okay, so guys. Yeah. yeah. Um, if not, this is co-creation here, or the co-creation sex. <laughs> I know that's why. Unless we want to put shown. Had mal aufgeschrieben, welche das ist. Aha, yeah, 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 yeah. Also this, einigermaßen, and this. No, no. Mit Education, ich glaube, das ist mit, ja, das ist Europe's Young Innovators und die, die, die meinen wirklich Young. Anschauen. Ja, also bei. Das war, nee, weil ich das Aha. Will ich da immer zurückmachen? Ja, 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 doch, 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 doch. Doch, doch also wenn man hier drauf klickt, sorry, hier. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then of more. Here we go. Collaborative participatory relationships still are relevant stakeholders to actively shape political priorities. Co creation. That is the sign. And the second is the, the, the big data policy. Geschichte. It's on PDF to download. It's not easy to remember. Yeah. Club. And of more clicks than since the so I club the call must young ones here then and then go. Club this is the scan to work program. This is this uh, this this title. 
Das zweite ist das Work Program for Co-Creation. Und dann hast du sie alle dann. Ja, und dann sind sie alle. Also die Nummer 6 hatte ich eigentlich gemeint. Also da könnte man auf jeden Fall sagen, ja, das ist alles gut mit Big Data, aber es gibt ja auch diese, also man braucht ja eine ganz an, einen ganz anderen Ansatz, weil ansonsten, da wird ja mit Big, Big Data alles Mögliche machen, man weiß ja nicht, ob, ja. ob man alle... Ich meine, äh, Repräsentativität ist mal ein großes Thema. Ja, genau. Dann das Zweite ist, wenn die jetzt Co-Creation haben wollen, dann muss man auch sicherstellen, dass eine bestimmte Gruppe nicht benachteiligt nicht wird, benachteiligt die, die wird. ja ist. genau und man muss ja auch und, und eine, ein Grund warum die Leute sich nicht zu viel beteiligen ist weil, weil sie weil, weil die Entscheidungen intransparent sind und die sind ja nicht transparent wenn, wenn die Regierung das macht aber die sind umso intransparenter wenn der Algorithmus entscheidet ja. die Frage ist was wäre jetzt hier ein gutes Thema ah, ein das weiß ich, auch nicht. weiß ich auch nicht da müsste man wahrscheinlich mit man müsste wahrscheinlich mit Susan reden. Halford. Ja. Weil die sind ja, die machen Social Policy. Na, ein Thema, was Susan mal erwähnt hatte, war, mhm. dass so also die Public Transport oft ähm, finanziell schwache Gebiete besonders benachteiligt. Mhm. Die Frage ist natürlich, wie, wie man das irgendwo mal macht. In den, es gibt nicht so viele Aktivitäten, wo man sagt, das braucht man jetzt regelmäßig und, und so weiter. Mhm. Und ja, da, äh, wir hatten da auch mit dem Ding mit der Sophie, ähm, da sind wir übrigens noch dran, jetzt die Woche ist Laura mhm. zurück. Mhm. Mhm. Haben wir gesagt, das Fast verlieren schon. wir nochmal. Ja, 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 ja. Ähm, dann äh, ist zum Beispiel eben sowas wie finanzielle Kapazität, über ich fragen gleich, ob das auch ein perfektes Characteristic wird. Ja, also sicher, also hier müsste man schon mit, mit anderen zusammenarbeiten. Weil das ist ja kein Problem. Auf der Technologieseite, da können wir es alles Mögliche überlegen. Auch Aber auf der Co-Creation-Seite. Da bräuchte halt ein gutes Thema. Ja. Also, ich könnte natürlich auch die Maria mal nochmal fragen. Dass die was wüsste. Maria, wer? Wimmer, die ist bei uns E-Government. Die hat alle möglichen Connections zu Deutscher Städtetag und sowas. Ähm ja. ja, weil dann kann man auch gezielt in England danach suchen. Ja. Wenn man jetzt sagt, ja, das ist zum Beispiel ein Use Case. Ja. Wie viel Geld ist es? Ich habe schon wieder vergessen. Ja, vier bis fünf. Ah. Also schon ein bisschen. Aber es sind aber, glaube ich, nicht so viele. Also ja. wir diskutieren das noch im Rahmen glaub, von einem anderen ja. Proposal, weil wir haben ähm, Sense for Us, ist was, was ein bisschen in die Richtung geht. Mhm. Also von der Thematik her hätte mhm. es jetzt nichts mit, mit dem zu tun, was mhm. wir gerade angesprochen mhm. haben. Mhm. Ähm, und äh, ja, ich glaube, es waren nur zwei Proposals oder sowas. Ja, das genau, das sind zwei. Ja. I'll give you five more minutes, yeah? Fertig. Five more minutes? No, you're done. All right, everyone, most people seem to be done. That's not the right device. Okay. So, let's see. Who was done? You guys were done. So, tell me. Classify those papers 
somewhere in a database. Then we give these records to uh, to lost people to actually see whether they are using the DBPA dataset or they have just mentioned DBPA. Uh -huh. And then after that, hold it right there. So. The task, so what you're telling me is that you're going to give a person a paper. Yeah, now this paper can be a journal submission with 45 pages. What exactly are you going to show to, to the people? No, actually we give only the place from where data set starts, from the paper. We'll actually write a program to actually classify the paper and then the section where it starts with experimentation of the data set, we'll take that page out of that paper uh -huh. so that it will get reduced. So you're going to show that, all right? Very well. Yes. The idea is just to reach the crowd start we have. Instead of giving one thousand, ten thousand papers for the crowd, so somehow we want to apply the interest that we do. Yeah. Yeah. To find out which papers actually need mm -hmm. uh, inside. Yeah. Okay. So we reduce the papers. And yeah. Okay. Yes, so what, how exactly are you going to do it? So you, you told me you take this one section, whatever, so you're going to show the person a blob of text. Yeah? Uh, Is this we correct? Can, we can take it out of the page. We can, um, well, the yes. Page. Sorry. Usually the paper to reach the, uh, the research is in the experiment section. Fair uh, enough, but, but the question still applies. So you're going to show a page of text, possibly with the phrase DBpedia highlighted, yeah? And the reason, uh, so the reason I'm insisting on, on these trivial details is because this is the level of detail you need to think about, yeah? So one page of text, DBpedia. What are you going to ask? Uh, we are uh, asking that whether DBpedia is just mentioned or it has been used. I mean, did you see any paper which says whether DBpedia Hmm? It's just mentioned or it has been used. So if it has been used, we have written we got 95% uh, accuracy in the DBPDA data set. So we just uh, want the user to verify. Uh-huh. Okay. So you're going to have a yes and no question? Yes or no? Yes. No, I don't know. Not sure. Yes or no. Do you give an I don't know option? Yes. Why? You had your chance. We decided to make a sentence, or rather, than, or a paragraph, rather than a sentence, and then just you're going to make errors in that data classification, which is usually a lot of people didn't do it. So have we have we listened to this? Yeah. So many other tasks are less trivial for the machine than find the string DBpedia. Yeah. So in many cases, you're going to have if the data comes from an algorithm, it's going to be full of rubbish. And then you're going to ask people to execute a task that is flawed. So forcing them to say yes or no will just skew your data for no good reason. Sorry? You can, but the algorithm is not 100% perfect, no matter when, yeah? So, now, what is wrong with giving people the I don't know option? Most of the people will say, I don't know. Why? <laughs> An annoying task. Okay, but no, I'm not forcing anyone to do it, yeah? Yes, please. Exactly. So, the whether it is boring or not, so people will go for minimal effort. Yeah? And they will just click I don't know. Yeah? But it's pretty easy to set up a thing where it just says if you're wrong, don't pay them. Right. Yes. So, we don't pay them if they're wrong. Or if you get too many wrong. If so, so question is the question is if someone gets 
wrong answers all the time, we stop paying them. We get them out of the system, kick them out. Why is this not a good idea? Because we don't know what's wrong. Yeah? So before you kick people out, just make sure that you've asked them something meaningful. Exactly. So don't kick them out. You don't need to kick them out. You can still take the data that they've put in and use it as a signal. Yeah? You don't have to not pay them. Of course, if you identify that they're spamming on purpose, you don't pay them. You don't encourage that. But in many cases, people will just give their best shot, and they will fail. And this, the answer, your reaction to that should not be necessarily, I'm not going to pay them. Yeah? Your answer to that should be, can I use this data for something else? Can I use this data, for instance, as a signal that there might not be one answer to my question? Yeah? This yes and no DBPT example is perhaps very easy. But even using, so going back to how you're going to phrase your question, is DBpedia mentioned? No. Is DBpedia used? Yes. So that's already broken, yeah? Because is DBpedia mentioned? Yes. Is DBpedia used? What does this actually mean? As the, what does this mean? All right. So how should someone with no scientific training be able to answer that question? Yes. Links to what? Links. Yeah. Yeah. Uh huh. All right. Comments about that. So the, the suggestion was we are going to give people the link to DBpedia or to whatever data set, and then people will click on the li link, and then if the link is broken, exactly. Okay. Fair enough. Is this the problem I wanted to solve? No. That problem, with that task, you're solving what problem? Yes. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's, 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 it's the right intuition. The question is, of course, how do you define those patterns? Yeah? And, and it goes, and I go back to my question about how do you define use? Yeah? And how do you explain what usage of data set means to someone who's used to look for rectangles and images? Yeah? That's the competition, people. That's so, so that's the type of tasks that you typically have on, not to mention the fact that no one will read the one section, yeah? So you have to cut down the task as well. Any, I want one more idea, and then, and then I can, I can uh, try to, to finish up this part. Who else? Any other ideas on how to do it? No? Can we have few experts? Very well. It is expensive, but you're going to get rubbish data the way you are doing it. Um, yes? Here we go. Here we go. So instead of just doing string matching on the paper text, you could actually think about a little bit about the domain, about how citations work. 
yeah, and try to get that as additional source of evidence. You could address experts. Now, someone said they're expensive. Who says I'm paying them? No, who says, yes, also that, but who says I'm paying them? Who says I'm not asking the authors of the paper to do the annotation themselves because by that then whenever a new version of DBpedia comes up, something beautiful will happen with their papers and they're going to get more citations. But that assumes one, that you get emails, and two, that they're expensive. Yes. But their time is expensive. And so they but they easy. want to get their citation numbers up. No, 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 no. If, they're in, if I set up the social machine, my research is I want to establish links between papers and data sets, but their interest is that by that their citation count goes up. Here we go. This is, this, is, this is exactly that sort of soft spot that I mentioned where the stars align, I get what I want, you get your promotion, and everyone's happy. Yeah? So, we see there are all sorts of things, and not, so let me just walk you through some more ideas, yeah? Just to see, even for this relatively simple example, how many options you could consider, yeah? So, remember we had this what and who and how and why, yeah? Always when you do crowdsourcing, you apply it to something that you cannot use out of the box as an algorithm. Yeah? You need to have a purpose to do that. Um, in our example, the task I was thinking about is you have a research paper and you create an annotation, a link, whatever you want to call it, to a data set. Now, we talked about the, what is called in crowdsourcing the representation of the domain. So, what am I going to show? Am I no, one, no one talked about the fact that sometimes I don't have access to the papers. They're behind the L's of your paywall. Yeah. I just have the abstract. I just have the title. Yeah? How are you going to do that? So, in more general terms, think about what exactly are you going to show? And where do you get that information? Sometimes you have all sorts of weird data that doesn't have a human readable interface. How are you going to show that to anyone who doesn't know anything about it and ask him to do something relevant, some sort of pattern matching on it? Yeah? Right? Um, what, if, what if the paper is not available? Yes. What if the domain is not known in advance? Well, that's, that's something, it doesn't quite apply to this example, but so there is a project we've been doing in the UK which is called Open Addresses. Uh, the Open Addresses is as follows. So, um, Open Addresses means street, street number, and um, postcode, yeah? Like in any other place. Haha, <laughs> we have it. It's just that it's not open data. So you have no, it's not. Yeah, it's been sold when the mail was privatized. The data was sold with it. Yeah? So now it belongs to a private entity who wants to get money every time you ha you need a list of street 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 numbers and postcodes, you have to pay. So we thought, how about we crowdsource this? Right? So the problem is, the problem we're trying to solve is, we have all the postcodes, they're open. We also know some of the addresses, and we want to know which numbers belong to each street, and which combination of street, num street number, number and street belong to each postcode. The task in itself is not particularly difficult. But then again, you think about what is the domain representation? Do I show it on a map? Do I show it just as a text? What am I going to show to the people? And the second question is, how do I carry out the entire task? I need a full list of 
of, of everything, of every possible number combination and street name, that's already, I mean, I need some way to know what, is, what are the one million, ten million tasks that I have to ask to the crowd. So that is not always trivial. All right. Do we know the list of potential answers? So there is a difference between knowing the answer and knowing that the answer is one of these five things and nothing else. Can someone explain me why? Can someone explain me why do I why is it why does it make a difference if I know the list of potential answers? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, if I know, if I know the street numbers in the UK are always between 1 and 100. Yeah? Or if I know that on the one side of the street I'm going to have the odd numbers and on the other side of the street I'm going to have the even number. This helps me tremendously in identifying wrong answers. Or in other words, calculating how confident I am that the answer is correct. Yeah? So everyone who's saying 120, I'm going to say immediately out. And if they say 120 for many times, I'm probably going to classify them as spammers as well. Yeah? Then I can look at patterns. Yeah? So I can implement algorithms to identify the likelihood of correct answers. Even the I have absolutely no idea which street is, wh what number belongs to which, which house on the map. Yeah? Is there only one correct solution to the task? Again, it's important. No one told me, for instance, that so the, your task before was, here's the paper, here's the Wikipedia, yes or no? How about versions? Yeah, DBpedia has, I don't know, 25 versions. It could be that they use one version on the other. It could be that they use both versions as well. Yeah? E there, there are more complicated cases. Yeah? So there are, there are questions which do not have one unique answer. If I show you one picture of something, of this, for instance, this landscape, and I'm going to ask you, what, is, what do you see there? You're going to see all sorts of objects. You're going to, you're going to see this tree, and someone will just call it tree, and the other one will, will, uh, will call it lime tree, and the other one will call it something else. And all of these things are correct answers. And you'll have to be able to appreciate them. <laughs> yeah? How many people would solve the same task? So I, I, I told you a little bit about redundancy and why you need this. And you, have to, you have to think about how much redundancy you build in, because the more you have, the more confident you're going to be that, the, that you can identify the correct answer from the set, but it's also going to take more time. And if you pay, it's going to cost more money. Good thing is, in general now, if you go on any decent microtask crowdsourcing platform, you will see templates and guidelines for a huge range of tasks. Anything that has to do with images, for images where you recognize one object or more objects, um, where you have a predefined set of answers or just an, an, an open set of answers to transcriptions to a whole range of tasks. Yeah. So it's getting, people are getting more and more knowledgeable into how to do this effectively. Now let's think about the who. So the only thing that <coughs> crowdsourcing tells us is that it is an open crowd. The, uh, what this means, it means yes, Potentially, you want to address a larger number of people than you would if you would do this in a more traditional setting, like in the lab. Um, it also means that you don't know anything about these people. And you also don't have any relationship with them, probably, whatsoever. Relationship means that you can 
influence them to behave in a certain way because of your previous relationship. So there is one way in which me, the manager of a team, would speak to my employees and would tell them, we need to annotate these images by Monday, people. Yeah? So then they will start saying, no, 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 no. I will say, yes, we're going to do it. Then we can still decide how we're going to do it, how we're going to split the work, and then they're going to start working. Yeah? I can promise them some additional rewards. Then I could say, for instance, the one who finishes first is going to get half a day off. Yeah, I have all these means. What would happen? It would happen, yeah, so I have my means. So someone really wants to take their half a day off and will push through it and will try to finish early. However, it can also happen that people just don't want to be much better than their peers because everyone would hate them. Oh, look at this guy. He already, I mean, it's clear we had already lots of work to do and this guy went ahead and did it. Yeah? Yes, but this applies in crowdsourcing as well because I always have to, if you do rewards, you always have to refresh them. So, so the advantage is in a traditional setting, I know exactly who the people are, I know what they're good at or not, uh, and I have some buttons to push. In an open call, I have potentially lots of people. They decide when they want to engage with me or not. Yeah? Um, I don't know anything about them. And the only means I have, the only buttons I can push are the ones that are on the platform. I don't even know what motivates them. I have absolutely no idea why they're on that registered on that platform whatsoever. Yeah? So I have to work with much weaker assumptions than in, in here. I mean, in here, if I do a crowdsourcing exercise with you guys, I don't know you, but I already know much more about you than if I do things on a completely open platform on the web. I know that probably you're, you have a certain level in your education, that you're interested in web science, that you probably have one of these 10 backgrounds, and you want the certificate at the end. Yeah? Um, it, that's already a lot. And I can work with these assumptions. But there are just 50 of you, not a million. So it's going to take some time and some convincing for me to do for you to actually start engaging with the crowdsourcing exercise. Yes? So when we use assumptions, we generally have these selectors. Yeah. And then we give them parameters that allow them to select if they want to use 10 sentences, 100 sentences, whatever, to get paid the same amount. But then you can also collect, uh, yeah. you know, what are these other ones? Yeah. So yes. So. It gives you a way to check if they're the same. I mean, they put out the same answer. Exactly. So you can. Spamming, because you actually don't know who these people are, because you never meet them, they never meet you, uh, they will act in a certain way. Yeah? So there is no clear punishment for them cheating. In fact, there are lots of people on these platforms that just sit in front of the computer, don't even move the mouse, and keep clicking. And that's all they're doing. And it turns out, in some cases, if the requester doesn't do their work properly, they get paid. Yeah? They just, don't, they just sit and click. They don't even move the mouse. This happens. On a more positive note, you want to give, you want your work to be, to be completed fast. You also want the people who really want to engage with you to do this and to have a good experience because they will come back and you don't necessarily want to always have to engage with a million people. If I find 50 good people who want to work, why not? So I want to identify them. And this is why you look at the performance of the people and you try to get as much knowledge about your crowd as possible so that you converge towards this more traditional scenario. Yeah? And then you can do all sorts of things that you would do in good management as well. You would do bonuses. You would agree with them that you would work with them on a more permanent basis. Um, all of this happens. And there are crowdsourcing platforms that offer all these services. Yeah? Uh, but you just have to think. You just have to think about the crowd in these terms. The advantages that you have when you, in principle, address large numbers of people. <coughs> which have low expectations, and the, what you actually need done. So, in our example, 
Let's go back. Papers and DBpedia. So you could do this in the open world. You could also think about just addressing people who know the papers, people from one community. So you go to a conference and you say, let's do this. You think about your incentives, obviously. But then if you go to the Semantic Web Conference and you have 600 people, this is a decent size of a community. And these are people who know you don't have to explain what use means, perhaps. Perhaps. Yeah. Um, you could actually think about more general about scientists. So at least they know what the paper is. <laughs> at least they know that experiments use data sets. Again, you can phrase. You can think about librarians. Never, no one talk, thought about librarians. Librarians are used to do lots of manual labeling of papers. They look at papers. They put metadata. They organize them all the time. Maybe they don't actually know what using a data set in physics means. But they look at the papers anyway. And they categorize them. So why not asking them on the side to say, oh, by the way, if you see this string over there, could you just read this quickly and see whether, yeah? So another option. Um, games. You could think of some sort of a game, which doesn't necessarily have to have a scientific narrative around it, but something where you can take some bits of text and, 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 and build the narrative around it and ask them if you see this text and do something. I don't know. Yeah? Someone uh, flies a spaceship through the universe, and then they go there, and they read something on the screen, and part of what they see on the screen is uh, one sentence from your paper. There's lots of decorum. But it's a game, so if you get it right, who knows? Uh, maybe, maybe this will work as well. So my point here is, think about this trade-off between having lots of people with little knowledge and little self-interest in, 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 in the actual task versus smaller groups that have more knowledge, of which you know more uh, in advance. Um, and then try to think about when would they engage with the task. I never said at the beginning you have to go to Mechanical Turk or to Crowdflower. You could do it on Twitter if you want. Yeah? Uh, you could do it as part of, I don't know, your document writing environment. So while I write the paper, uh, when I compile it or whenever, um, when you build in a table or when you, you could think about the markup language or some, some sort of integrated way of adding data set information to the paper as well. Yeah? You could think about when people submit their papers to a conference and they have to register, you ask them for the data set information, otherwise they are not registered. So, all sorts of things you could do to collect this information, and they're all valid. All right, so more general information. Um, on Mechanical Turk and similar platforms, you have the advantage that you have lots of people that you can target. They're not always ideal for all sorts of tasks. So you have biases in terms of, uh, <coughs> in terms of demographics, the countries they're coming from. Um, you also have biases in terms of the types of tasks they tend to like and the types of uh, skills that they have. So you can have, an ac you can have access to the, to the slides and have a, have a closer, closer look. Um, timely delivery, it is, it is possible. I mean, it definitely takes sh less time than traditional experiments in the lab. Um, Nevertheless, there is absolutely no guarantee. And if, there, if, if you want to get results in a particular time frame, you'll have to think about increasing the rewards. You have to think about using other models of crowdsourcing as well. So you, you could think potentially about keeping people busy until the task arrives, yeah? So, so that they are always online and just waiting for you. And the moment when you, so you give them something to do, 
which you don't really need, but people are there. And when the actual paper arrives and you want to know within a millisecond if it's about DBPD or not, they are there. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. Um, some more statistics. Now let's think a little bit about how you would do it. So there is this element of explicit versus implicit participation, which was mentioned a little bit in the examples of social machines we had earlier. And I've also told you about citizen science and how talking too much, emphasizing too much the scientific asp uh, aspect makes people less likely to engage with the, with the task. Yeah. Um, sometimes you require coordination. We've seen that in the example about the document translation. Um, I've also spoken a little bit about why it is actually important in time not to just randomly assign tasks to people, but to try to learn who are your best contributors and to try to think about each of those people who engage with you, what they would, how you would make best use of their time and of their skills. And I don't mean here just paid scenarios. I mean, for instance, citizen science as well, or any type of volunteer. There are people on Wikipedia who just like checking spelling mistakes. Fair enough. If this is what they want to do, if this is what they feel comfortable with, why not? Yeah? So what you want to do in a system is to be able to identify what every person is good at and then give them the type of tasks they, they engage with. Yeah? So it is about profiling each group of contributors in terms of their strengths and their weaknesses, and then matching what needs to be done with these skills. Oh, right. Um, partial or independent answers consolidated. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let me see if I can give an example. Um, let's, think about, let's think about image labeling as an example. Yeah? Um, so I want, in, in the ESP game, you see an image, and then you write a, label, a tag. And you get points and advance only if your other player writes in the same word. Now, you really need to make sure that the two answers match. So, you need to be a bit flexible and a bit smart about how you match to when you say two answers are the same. Because it could be that the answer is actually a phrase and someone just gives you the first word and the other person is giving you the whole phrase. Could be that someone has spelling mistakes in it, that they write it in a different way. Yeah? Um, you don't want, you want to be flexible enough not to frustrate the people, because if they have to try out five different spellings for the same thing, they will most certainly stop. But you also can't be too flexible, because then your data will be less accurate. So you have to think about these. You have to think about these things very carefully. You're going to have to think about when do you consider two answers of being the same. Obviously, when you have a closed set of answers, so it's either yes, no, or maybe, then that's it. But it's not always the case. For example, if you remember what I told you about machine translation, that example, or if it's about shortening sentences or uh, improving text, anything that can be done in more than one way, you will have to think, either you'll have to think about how you, when you're going to say if two paragraphs are comparable, or if you can't do that, then you do what? Then you do another round of crowdsourcing. Yeah? So if you have two answers and it's too difficult for you to say if they're the same, for instance, when you have synonyms, yeah? um, then you're most likely going to have to go through a slightly more complex workflow and then you're going to ask you're going to ask people this answer and this answer are they the same yes no maybe and then you're in a situation you have a second iteration with a with a 
closed set answer, which you can then, then use. Yeah? What other things do I have here? Uh, right, so in the example with the papers, we've talked about training algorithms. Um, I've also talked about using Twitter. So how about organizing some sort of competition? Yeah, so you can have a daily thing, or you go to a conference and you organize at the beginning of the day, you say, at the end of the day, I'm going to give you, I'm going to give uh, 200 euros to the person who's going to give me, the, fa the first person who's going to give me uh, this, this answer. Yeah, you calculate what the budget is going to be, you calculate how many, how many uh, papers you have to annotate. That's, that's another way to do it. We talked about involving the authors. Yeah, so for instance, you can use crowdsourcing to find out the, tw the relevant Twitter accounts of people that are potentially interested in engaging because you look at the topics they have, you look if they post links to papers, yeah? So you could actually build your community, then you can launch a campaign on Twitter, yeah? Various ways to do this, various uh, crowds you can address. We talked about validation already, so there is this distinction between closed and open answers. If you have open answers, you have to think about ways to say how, um, when answers match. Sometimes you just get partial answers as well, and you'll have to, you'll have to combine them. Um, so, for instance, for instance, if you have, say, images in which you have to recognize multiple objects, you don't know how many, ob either you know how many objects there are, but in most cases, you're just going to have an image. Like in, on Zooniverse, there is this project called Snapshot Serengeti. You have pictures taken from the Serengeti National Park with animals. Um, so you don't know how many animals are in there. You assume there are one of these 60 types of animals that you typically see in the park, yeah? So, the question is then, you ask the people, oh, well, why don't you just click on all the animals you see? What is the answer? For, you will get most likely partial answers. Some people will just do these two, and then these other people will see these three at the bottom. Um, so it's not going to be, and, and, they're not just going to click in one area. Yeah, so you'll have those, when are two answers the same? You'll have to think about some sort of regions and the boundaries of those regions to, to say that, well, this click here is pretty much the first is the same thing as this click a little bit to the left. Yeah? And then you have to combine everything to just identify all 10 zebras on the image. Yeah? Because most likely, not all, most people will not click on all 10 of them. Just give three and move on. Yeah? So not entirely straightforward. But, and this is what I'm going to wrap up with, um, it's all relatively easy and predictable <laughs> compared to the question of why would people give a damn, yeah? Um, so the theory tells us that people do things for one or more of these three reasons. They do it for love, they do it for glory, and they do it for money. Yeah? So, glory means some sort of extrinsic motivation. I'm doing it because I'm interested in what the rest of the world thinks about me. The leaderboard. Yeah? Love is about, I'm doing it because I feel better when I finish this game round faster than yesterday. It doesn't mean I have to share this information with my friend, but I just feel better. And I love doing it. And then there are the rewards. The points, the badges, everything else that comes with it, yeah? Economics also tells us that when you use love or glory, it helps reduce costs, obviously. If people do it because they love it or because they care about what other people think about them, you don't have to pay them, yeah? If you find a scenario in which whatever you ask them to do is either love or glory, that's fine for you. Money and glory make the crowd move faster. They don't make it work much better. But they do make sure 
that you're going to get your results at the same level of quality but faster than you want. Yeah? So if you increase the price, you're not going to get better quality. Actually, if you increase the price too much, you're going to get something called the choking effect. People will be so nervous in solving the task that their performance is going to go down. So they have to feel comfortable. They can't be too stressed about, oh my god, what if I lose this? But they will not necessarily work better. They're just going to be more engaged with the task and try to solve it. Yeah? So these three things. In our example, let's think about why would people do this. So I have the papers and I have those date sets. Who is interested in having this? Me because I'm doing the research. Um, the publishers are interested in doing this. The publishers, like Springer and ACM, and, and uh, publishers of, of scientific papers, they're interested in this because they have lots of links. So this means they drive traffic. They means they can offer a better experience. Yeah? They definitely have an advantage. You could think about the authors having an advantage as well, like I was saying. If there is a built-in mechanism by which my citations grow, then why not? The community that builds the data set has an, has an interest in it as well, because they can show, oh, look, my data set is used by all these, in all this research to so give us more money, to make it better. Yeah? Um, or that person is going to get a promotion because the data set that they're maintaining is used in so many papers. Yeah? Open access advocates. They're going to say, oh, look, if we put the data sets online, look at all these papers. The number of papers is much bigger than it used to be. Yeah? All these people, all these groups, they have an interest in getting this data somehow. Then if you think about glory, it's about, well, the person who is such a good citizen for the scientific community that they receive an award. You can think about competitions. Um, you could think about different types of payments as well. Now, there are payments and payments. When you, in, in Mechanical Turk, you pay everyone who did the good job. In Kaggle, you pay the first, the best solution, typically. Yeah? Uh, and there is always a balance, and there's lots of literature in economics about how many people do you actually pay. Because you want to pay enough people so that, for them, it is worth making that investment, yeah? versus um, you don't want to give out 100 awards to make the individual awards less prestigious and to have a huge bu budget to spend. So, so there are some trade-offs there as well. Yes? No, but they want their papers to, they want their papers to be described well. Yeah? Yes. Yes, but it's a self-motivation. So they're doing it for themselves. Yeah? That's just, that's, they want to do science. They want to have their papers annotated. Whether someone else uses them or people respect them for that or they get money for it, that's, uh, that's, that's not the, 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 the point necessarily. So when you just talk about love, you talk about self-esteem. You talk about enjoying the task. I love writing Wikipedia articles about football, yeah, because I love football, so I, write, I like writing about it. I like the fact that I learn about football a lot while editing the article. That's something I'm passionate about. It doesn't really care how many people read the article. It's just me doing something I enjoy. Yeah? All right. Um, some notes on pricing, though this is actually outdated. So like I was saying, the prices on, on, on these platforms are rising. There is a good paper, the dub, 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 last year, which made a survey on how much it actually costs to do these things. And, and I think this is 
my final slide now. Um, just because, just because you use a platform that has some sort of rewards, it doesn't mean that the other types of motivations don't apply. In fact, it's really, really complicated. Yeah. So I said love and glory reduce costs, but it doesn't mean that you cannot pay people for doing things. In fact, gamification does just that. People love playing games, but the fact that they're getting points, which is the reward, helps as well. Yeah? And at the same time, it could just destroy whatever intrinsic uh, uh, motivation you have. So if all of a sudden I would start paying people who contribute on Wikipedia, what do you think will happen? Goes down. Why does it go down? Uh, there's an intrinsic and extrinsic motivation. Mm -hmm. These people are generally intrinsic motivated. And yeah. There's been a lot of studies that have that. Yes. So those studies have shown <sighs> there are many things. First of all, they would probably attract, at the moment, people just like either doing the work or they like their sense of community or they like how they're perceived as someone, an expert in that community. Now, if you start paying them, some of them will start thinking about, oh, is this what I'm worth? Is this all these hours that I'm putting in and you're giving me $100? Yeah? So there will be a question about how much is that contribution worth? Then there would be a question of all these people who weren't so willing to contribute, all of a sudden, oh, $100, mm hmm yeah? they would start working to reach whatever target this hundred dollars is, yeah? Thousand words. Um, so you'd get all sorts of other people who weren't intrinsically mo or extrinsically motivated all of a sudden there. The dynamic of the system will, will, will change. People would start perceiving it as work. Yeah, it is with, they will not contribute, they will not be willing to spend their weekends working for it, doing the work, yeah? And finally, finally, just because you actually have a price tag on something, you should never assume that people will just do more of it, yeah? So pe people will not just want more and more money. There are lots of studies in which they have shown that actually in most cases, people just want to reach a certain amount and then they're going to stop. In theory, they could go on for two more hours and earn more, but actually they don't really, they don't really care that much, yeah? So increasing the amount of money that someone could potentially, the reward that someone could potentially earn, doesn't actually mean that you will drive more participation. Like I said, it's not going to get better, it's just going to get faster. People will get on with it faster, they're going to get their reward, and then they're going to move on. All right, so, in summary, I, even for this very specific problem of building links between date sets and papers, you could do it in at least 10 different ways, yeah? And I have, we haven't even looked at one particular scenario and how the potential contributors would be motivated, and what you could do to encourage them to behave in a certain way or to continue to engage with you, yeah? Um, but I think, I hope I at least gave you an idea about the types of questions you need to think about. And if you do that, and then if you do the other thing that I said at the beginning, you listen. You have to, you have to understand that your first design is not going to work. You have to be able to listen to what the data tells you. Do you see the behavior of people and adjust? Or you can just talk to the community. So it should never be about, oh, this person gave me the wrong answer. He's not going to get paid. It's a bit more complicated than that. Yeah? Um, you have to be able and willing to listen and see what people are doing. Or even, even listen to them changing your own rules that you have defined. Yeah? Um, and allowing them to contribute other things that you didn't ask them for. Because they're there, those people who will make those suggestions are the ones that are intrinsically motivated. They're interested in whatever you're doing. 
or in the group of people that you have managed to put together. And these are the types of people that you want to work with to make this social machine successful. All right. That's it for now. Um, any questions before you go and do your project? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. So there are two answers to that. There's lots of crowdsourcing projects that are based on volunteer work. So people actually like contributing to the project. <coughs> and as such, then there is this love, enjoyment element. Yeah? I like contributing to Wikipedia because I like the topic. Yeah? Um, that's the first question, the first answer. The second answer is, it's never just one of the three. It's always a little bit of, of everything. So for instance, we've been running these experiments on Mechanical Turk on Crowdflower, where the, exper the baseline experiment was image labeling for payment. Straightforward. It's been done millions of times. But now we thought about, how about we try to gamify the task as well? and make it a bit more appealing than the plain type of interface you always see. So can we see what happens then? If we keep the price tag, if we fix it, but the task has a gamification element to it or a sociality element to it, it's a bit, it's a bit more engaging and targets perhaps love and glory as well. What would it happen? And the results were, 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 were stunning because people kept on engaging with a task until we had no images more to annotate. For no particular reason, they went and recommended the task to their friends. And so, so what you see there, that it is not just about the actual payment. It's also about how much they enjoy the task. Yeah? And then we, tried, we, we went further and we tried to learn to profile them. And when they were just about to leave, we, we gave them more money. We gave them access to new data. We gave them access to all sorts of things to see what keeps them going. And the top contributors, the people who do most of the work, those 10% that you see in every community, even when you have volunteer work, those 10%, they weren't interested in the money. They weren't interested in any sort of gamification gadgets. They were interested in getting better at what they were doing. The price was always the same. So they would earn that $1. Not more, not less. They could earn 10 cents more, but they weren't interested in that. They were interested in knowing how the other ones solved the same question or to get feedback on their work. And this is where the love element comes in. Because this is me becoming better at what I'm doing. And perhaps it, this will translate in a monetary advantage in the long run. But it's just about me improving the performance. And that's, that's an intrinsic motivation. Yeah? All right. Good. Right. Thanks a lot, Elena. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Our small token of appreciation. Oh, thank you. Alcohol. Good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot to do it. We need it in the UK these days to cope with reality. Yeah.